Yeah, welcome to Numerical Methods. Today we talk about time discretization of stochastic processes. So we start a new chapter. And let's maybe start with a small recapitulation yeah, of the basic ingredients, uh, Brownian motion and eto stochastic processes. So this chapter is about the time discretization of eto stochastic processes. Yeah, recapitulation, the Brownian motion. So what is the Brownian motion? So here we have the definition of the Brownian motion. So first one is that W of zero is zero. W is a stochastic process. So what's that? So a stochastic process is, you know, maybe let's say just the family of random variables. parameterized by time. So I have a time parameter, little t, and at initial time, say t equals zero, the w is zero. Yeah, it's a random variable, so p almost uh, surely. Then the map should be continuous. So the map t maps to W should be continuous, P almost surely. So if you fix an omega, plug it in here, you get a continuous function. So we have a continuous sample path. So say here is T. Yeah? So this here is maybe zero, yeah? which is your W of zero. So this is the starting point. And now I fix the sample path, then I just have a continuous function here. So this here is t maps to w of t. And okay, then I'm now on some sample path omega. So far I've fixed omega. Now, given a time discretization, we specify the increments. So you have here the Brownian increments for time discretization, T0, T1, T2, and so on. The Brownian increments, WT1 minus WT0 and WT2 minus WT1 and so on. WTK minus WTK minus one. They are all mutually independent. Okay, and now comes number four, and this tells us what this increment actually is. So if you have two times, little t is larger than little s, then the increment w of t minus w of s, this should be normal distributed with mean zero. And yeah, the variance, now note here this is a function mapping to Rn, yeah, so this is actually not a random variable, it's a random vector, yeah, so it's a vector of real valued random variable. So the variance should be the identity matrix multiplied with T minus S. So you see that if you have an increment, then the variance scales linear in time, grows linear in time. So this thing is, normal distributed, so this is maybe now the important part here. The increments are normal distributed with mean zero and covariance matrix T minus S times identity here. So the covariance is of course zero if I have WI and WJ are not equal to J yeah, because they are independent, but the variance of a single entry yeah, scales linear in time. Yeah, actually, you see that maybe number four is now really specifying what's going on, and it appears to be a little bit strict because I prescribe here any increments. Yeah, how do we actually know that if the increment from, say, T1 to T3 yeah, is normal distributed with this variance, yeah, then that this is consistent with T1 to T2 plus T2 to T3. So actually, number four is rather a consequence yeah, of number three, because recall, uh, these increments, they add up. Yeah? So the smaller increments add up to a larger increment. And 
you have the result that the sum of independent normal distributed random variables is normal distributed where the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. So here maybe note For independent normal distributed random variables, the variance of the sum is equal to the sum of the variances. So you see that if you now add two increments, first time step, second time step, yeah, then it's clear that the variance scales linear in the size of the time step. But also the aspect that we have normal distributed random variables is somewhat a consequence because recall our central limit theorem. So here x1, x2, x3, they are IID real valued random variables. So now consider these guys as your Brownian increments. Yeah. So the mean of these things is zero. So this mu goes away. So what you have here is that you just sum up these increments. And now you see that here in front, you rescale with the standard deviation. Yeah. So the square root of the variance. Yeah. So if now my variance scales linear, actually here I'm rescaling here with the square root of the number of time steps. Yeah? So the if, if a time step has size one yeah, and I do n time steps, so actually the variance is just n. So I rescale with the standard deviation one divided by square root of n. Okay, so maybe we set here a to minus uh, infinity. Then you see that this is just a distribution function and the distribution function is that of a normal distribution. So also that we have a normal distribution is maybe a consequence. So the core part of the definition is actually that we have these independent increments here. And then we see that this is consistent with the increments being normal distributed with variance scaling linear in time. Also note that this definition gives us some was a, a rule or a numerical method, how we can construct the value of the Brownian motion at a later time, say W of TK, if we know the Brownian increments. Well, the Brownian increments, they are the W TJ plus one minus the W TJ. Okay, I sum this up now. J from, I start in zero and I end in K minus one. And initially I have my W of T0 here, but which is zero. Okay, so this, this is zero, yeah. So if T0 is zero, yeah. So our time discretization starts in zero. So you just have that you can construct this Brownian motion at a later time out of these Brownian increments. So what you do is here in this picture, you start in say zero. So this here is W of zero is zero. Then you have an increment here from capital T zero. This is also zero to capital T one. You know the increment is normal distributed with mean zero. So this here is the mean. And then you sample a point from this distribution, from this normal distribution. So normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation now square root of the time step size. Okay, So maybe we sample this point. This point is now the new mean here. Huh? So I add another distribution with mean zero, means that I'm sampling around that point. Okay, I have a sample normal distributed with mean zero and standard deviation is also square root of the time step size. Maybe we come out here. Yeah, This point is then the center point for my next sample. Yeah, I have again mean zero around this point and I sample the last one.
Okay, so you see these guys here now form time discrete observations yeah, of my Brownian motion on a single sample path or maker. We can also do this in the computer. Yeah, we already know how we could do this. Let's have a look. I have a small experiment in our lecture repository. So here you have Monte Carlo Brownian motion, and there's a small program, Brownian motion sample path. Yeah, and now in addition to Monte Carlo parameters that I would try to sample multiple omegas, I also have now a time discretization because now I construct a time discrete stochastic process. So maybe we like to do 100 time step and the time steps are always the same. Yeah, so equipartitioning the interval from zero to one. So the time step size is 0 0.01. Okay, then I have a small program that plots now the sample path. So what do we do? We generate uh, a one-dimensional random number generator. This is a pseudo-random number generator, Mers and Twister. So I can generate out of the one-dimensional sequence, I can generate a vector. So recall, I'm now doing this algorithm here. I have a one-dimensional sequence. I'm populating a vector. I have to create a time discretization. So how many time points do we have? It's number of time steps plus one because the starting point and the end point are inside. Yeah, and then we populate our time discretization. This is just I times the time step size. So now I would like to generate the sample path of the Brownian motions. So I have a list. The outer list is now for different omegas. And then I have here a vector, and these are the observation of W of T0, T1, T2, T3, and so on, on that sample pass omega. We iterate over all omegas, over all sample paths, and I now allocate the sample pass omega. So this was... In this picture, now I would allocate the vector of four elements, yeah, red, blue, green, orange. Okay, I allocate this. So this has the same length as the number of times we have in our time discretization. The initial value of the pound in motion is zero. Okay, this line is not needed because the array is initialized to zero anyway. And then we loop over all time steps. So I sample a uniform. Out of the uniform, I create a normal using inversion of the distribution function. I calculate the time step size. The time step size is ti plus 1 minus ti. And then I scale the normal distributed random number here with square root of the time step size. So this gives me the standard deviation. So the variance, yeah, the square, would be time step. And this is my Brownian increment. So the value of my Brownian motion at the next time is the value at the previous time plus the Brownian increment. So we are doing exactly what we are doing here in this picture. And then I add this to my list of sample paths. So you could stop here with the debugger and uh, debug this program a little bit and uh, see Okay, how we add now here a sample path. So we have 100 time steps. So this is our uh, first first element in the list. Okay, so then here below I have a little bit of code that just plots these sample paths. Yeah, I have two different versions of plots. One is drawing the dots, the other one is not. Okay, that's maybe not so interesting. Maybe just run this program yeah, and this is our simulation of the Brownian motions. Okay, this, these are now uh, 1,000 sample paths yeah, discretized in 100 time steps. So actually, we don't create the W of T yeah, on 1,000 different omegas. We create the W of Ti on 1,000 different omega Ks. Yeah? So maybe we have to look at this picture where I draw the individual dots. Yeah? So we observe this brown in motion here at 
times, yeah, 0 0.4, 0 0.41, 0 0.42, yeah, and in between we now sample random variables, yeah, so we have 1,000 sample, and the transition probability, yeah, from one starting point here to the next starting point, this transition probability is always a normal. You also see here in the right picture, maybe nicely, that the standard deviation, yeah, is expanding a little bit like square root of t, yeah, so you see here at 0.1, I'm between say minus one and one, maybe a little bit less. Yeah? So if I go 10 time step further, yeah, from 0.1 to one, so it's a times 10, yeah, I'm now between minus three and three, yeah, square root of 10, approximately three point something. Now you see that this scales really like square root yeah, of time. Yeah, so nice, we can already get a good intuition for the pawn in motion using our numerical methods. Okay, code session, simulate sample paths of the pawn in motion. This is this class and you can try it out and modify it with the parameters. Next thing I would like to recapitulate is the e to stochastic process because now what I like to do is I would like to build more complicated stochastic processes out of the Brownian motion. So you see the Brownian motion is still here in this definition, but now with the differential, uh, there is the dw here, the Brownian increment, the infinitesimal Brownian increment. So what you see here is the differential notation of an Ito process. So dx is mu dt plus sigma dw. Yeah, this is just a short notation. Okay, so why is that just a short notation? Because actually there was something dropped, and the thing that is dropped is that you just apply here the integral from S to T, capital S to capital T. You apply it on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Okay, if you apply the integral S to capital T, to dx of t, yeah, that's just x at the upper bound minus x at the lower bound, yeah? The integrating the differential is just the upper bound minus the lower bound of the value. So you bring the lower bound yeah, to the other side, and now you have a rule that tells you how this x is constructed. You have x at the new value is x at the previous value plus the integral mu dt plus the integral sigma dw. Okay, integral mu dt is just the classical Lebesgue integral. Well, with the small modif modification that the mu is a function of a random variable, so mu could be a random variable if you have evaluated it or say a stochastic process. So this definition is then understood just pass-wise, yeah? so omega-wise, but it is just a Lebesgue integral. The question is, what is this other object here where you integrate with respect to the dw? So this is the e to integral. Okay, actually the e to integral is a little bit more general. You integrate with respect to some other integrator, some other stochastic process, dy. So this is the special case where the y is the Brownian motion. Well, if you look up how this e to integral is uh, defined, uh, well, it's quite similar to the Lebesgue integral, and you use elementary stochastic processes, elementary processes. You use processes that are piecewise constant yeah, on certain time discretizations. And if you look at this definition, you already see how you would generate or calculate the stochastic integral numerically or approximated with the Monte Carlo method for an elementary stochastic process. So let's just have a look. Yeah? If you have an elementary stochastic process, so just recapitulate this, then this means that your stochastic process phi, 
this is represented by a random variable ej multiplied with the indicator function of the time interval from tj to tj plus one. In other words, uh, if you now fix the omega, then as a function of time, this is a piecewise constant function. Yeah? And then of course, on different sample paths on different omega, this can be a different constant. So if it is a piecewise constant function, I'm integrating actually over these intervals, I'm integrating constants. And then you see that this integral here with respect to the dw is just the sum, use this constant and multiply with the Brownian increment. Okay, and we already know how to sample the Brownian increment. So this is the E2 integral for elementary processes. And now the general E2 integral, yeah, so if the process that is integrated, yeah, if the integrand is not such an elementary process, is not piecewise constant, this is defined as the limit yeah, where the sigma is then approximated by a sequence of these uh, elementary processes phi. Yeah, if this is the limit, yeah, then I already have a numerical method to approximate this integral. And if I have a numerical method to approximate this integral here, then I have a numerical method to approximate the x given that I have the previous value of the x. So I have a numerical method to approximate the x at discrete observation times. So this is what we will do now. We will discuss numerical schemes to form time discrete stochastic processes. So a sequence of random variables at discrete observation times, which can be understood as numerical approximations of the time continuous stochastic process in the sense that of the time continuous stochastic process observed at these discrete times. So we'd like to discuss the discretization of times. Um, what I will do now, I will just state some numerical schemes. Yeah? I will give a rough motivation for the Milstein scheme, yeah? which can serve a little bit like a proof, yeah? but you see how you move from Euler scheme to Milstein scheme. But I will just state the Euler scheme, the Milstein scheme, the predictor corrector scheme, and also show you the very nice technique yeah, of using Ito's lemma in combination with the Euler scheme to generate highly accurate numerical schemes. And we will have a numerical experiment, but I just state them and we will discuss convergence a little bit later. But already from our numerical experiments, we get an intuition that the convergence, the weak convergence is um, one divided by n, where n is the number of time steps. So what we will do is we will create time discrete approximations. So time discrete stochastic processes. So this means I have here an I yeah, that maps to a discrete time Ti. My time discretization is in the background. And on that, I have now my random variable X tilde of Ti. And this is then an approximation of the time continuous stochastic process x. We start with the Euler scheme. So given an Ito stochastic process here in this differential notation, so dx is mu dt plus sigma dw, then we have a time discretization ti. t0 is 0, yeah, and then T1, T2, T3, up to Tn. So we have n plus 1 times n time steps. And then we define the time discrete stochastic process X tilde, which we call the euler marijuana scheme of the process X. We define that as the value of X tilde at the next time point is the value of x tilde at the previous time point. 
note that our stochastic process is given here with an initial condition and we have the same initial condition for our time discrete stochastic process. So x0 is a constant, a random variable, yeah, whatever, your initial condition. So my scheme is given by saying that the value at the next time is equal to the value at the previous time plus mu, but now mu evaluated at the current time ti and also at evaluated at x tilde of ti multiplied with the time step size plus sigma also evaluated at time ti and x tilde of ti times the Brownian, Brownian increment. So note the important thing is that we freeze the arguments here. So we freeze at the time ti. And since we do not know the true solution, we do not know x, yeah? so I do not know x of ti. I only know the time discrete approximation. Yeah? I also plug in the time discrete approximation here. So this scheme is often also called stochastic Euler scheme or just Euler scheme. And obviously this scheme comes from a very simple approximation in our integrals. So recall this was here the differential notation. And to some extent, it looks a little bit as if you just replace the D by the delta, by the finite difference, yeah, when you move from here to there. But if you add the integral on both sides, yeah, you know that your differential notation is just a short notation. So let's apply the integral from ti to ti plus 1 to our differential notation. Then integrating dx from ti to ti plus 1, I have that this is x of ti minus uh, x of ti plus 1 minus x of ti x of ti to the other side plus the integral and now i have mu dt plus integral sigma dw and now assume that mu and sigma are maybe piecewise constant. Yeah? So they are constant on this interval from ti to ti plus one. Or yeah, assume that these are integrals, eto integral, that is approximated by an elementary process. Yeah? So I approximate the sigma by a process that is constant. If mu and sigma are constant, yeah, then this integral is just the value of this constant times for the dt part, the time step size, the value of the sigma for the dw part times the corner increment. So obviously the approximation that we do is approximate the coefficient mu of t and x of t by the value at the starting point of the interval. So mu of ti, x of ti, and also the coefficient sigma is approximated with sigma of ti, x of ti. Yeah? But then if the integrand is a constant, yeah, I have that this x is exactly multiplied with the time step size delta ti and multiply with the Brownian increment delta w of ti. So my Euler scheme is just given by approximating the integrand with a constant value, namely the value that we observe at the beginning of the interval. Plus, in addition, yeah, this would be true for the first step in our scheme because there we know the initial value. And the initial value is equal to the x yeah, at the starting point. But then, well, we accumulate a little bit the error because we don't have the x at ti as a starting point, we have the x tilde of ti as a starting point. But the approximation for the integral is this. 
You also see that uh, the Euler scheme is exact if the integrand is a constant. Or let's say piecewise constant. Yeah, we already have a nice rule to create a fairly large class of stochastic processes. You're hmm? having piecewise constant coefficients here. Uh, we can create many different stochastic processes. So in your computer program, you would have inside this loop here the Brownian increment like that. Yeah, but then in this rule here. Yeah. Actually, you would multiply the Brownian increment maybe with a different sigma, yeah? always a different sigma at a different time step, and you would add also a plus mu delta t in every time step to create some kind of drift, drifting upwards or downwards. The scheme is not accurate if the sigma and the mu yeah, are not piecewise constant. For example, my next thing is what? if sigma depends on x. So can we find a numerical scheme that is a little bit better? And this will be the Milstein scheme. And here is the motivation for the Milstein scheme. So assume your sigma, this is here my sigma, this guy depends on x, and now I call the variable x, y, because later I will move to the x again. Assume my sigma depends on this y. Say it is just linear sigma 1 times y. So it is not a constant. It is a constant with respect to time t, here. Yeah, but once my scheme evolves, I always plug in a different starting random variable. So this is my stochastic process dy is sigma y dw. Well, you can easily derive the solution of this stochastic process using Etos lemma. So here we call Etos lemma. So what I do is I transform to the variable z. z is logarithm of y. So this means that we have y is the exponential of the z. Well, why do I like to move to the logarithm of y? Yeah, if you divide here by this y, you have dy divided by y is sigma 1 dw. Yeah? So on the right-hand side, I have something with a constant coefficient for which I can calculate the integral. And what you have on the left-hand side, uh, this looks a little bit like derivative of the function divided by the function. You know that this is the derivative of the logarithm. If you move to the logarithm, Etos lemma will give you an additional factor, the minus one half sigma squared dt here. So the stochastic process is now for the z, not dz is sigma 1 times dw, but there's also the minus 1 half sigma squared. Uh, where does this minus 1 half sigma squared uh, come from? Um, okay, I already gave you a nice intuition in another sec section. Yeah, So you see that this model here describes the percentage change. Yeah? So if y is at 100, yeah, so I multiply this 100 maybe with 10% yeah, with a random in increment, so it goes 10% up or 10% down. Yeah? So it is a relative change. And now you know if you are at 100 and you go 10% up, you are at 110. If you go then 10% down, you are at 99. So there's a certain drift downwards. In, in this uh, model. And um, another way of seeing, seeing this, okay, the thing on the left-hand side, the dy, the y, is a martingale. Yeah? So you have that the expectation of the future values is equal to the starting value. So uh, assume that you move to the z, then assume that this part would not be here, 
then the set would also be a martingale. Yeah, it would just be a normal distributed random variable. But then you plug this normal distributed random variable in a nonlinear function. And now you know Jensen's inequality, right? Maybe you even know it from school. So Jensen's inequality tells you if you have a convex function, then the expectation of the convex function of a random variable is not equal to the convex function of the expectation. So this means I need some kind of correction factor. Yeah? And what is this correction factor? Well, this correction factor, well, my convex function here is the exponential. And this exponential is, let's do a Taylor expansion, 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared. Yeah? So this 1 plus x is linear. Yeah? Exp expectation will be just, again, um, expectation of that random variable, but the one half x squared is nonlinear. So now assume that you plug a z, z maybe starts initially at zero, and then you have, say, sigma one is one, you have a random increment, yeah, so you have a delta w. Say you plug in here the sigma one delta w, if you plug that in, then you will get out a one-half sigma squared delta w squared. Yeah? And the expectation of this guy, the expectation of this guy is just one-half sigma squared. Yeah, what is the variance of the Brownian increment? Delta t. Uh, so I plugged in now a sigma delta w, I got out of one half sigma squared delta t. So if you plug in the sigma one dw, you get out of one half sigma squared dt. So you see, if you would not have this thing here, my expectation would drifting up, yeah, but I would like to have the expectation of exponentials as I said to remain constant because it is a multi -gay. So this is a correction factor coming from the sigma one dw. So I am highlighting this a little bit that this term is associated with the dw in the x squared because this is important now for the next step. But now let's continue. I moved to the log coordinate. So I moved here to the uh, logarithm. So I have now d logarithm. On the right hand side, I now have constant coefficients. Yeah, so this is nice. Yeah, I have the minus one half sigma squared dt plus sigma dw. So I have constant coefficients on the right-hand side. I just apply the integral. So we apply the integral, say from t to t plus delta t for one time step. And you have that the logarithm of y at the next time step at the next time is equal to the logarithm of y at the previous time minus one half sigma one squared delta t plus sigma one delta w. So I can express it in my time step and my Brownian increment. And this is equal. Yeah? So this is the true solution. Now take exponential again on both sides and you have that you can express the process y as y times exponential and then you have the drift part minus one half sigma squared delta t plus the diffusion part sigma delta w inside, inside the exponential. This is also a numerical scheme. Yeah? It tells you next value constructed from the previous value multiplied with the exponential. And now you can just sample your normal distributed random variable and plug it in here. 
but I don't want to derive the exact scheme. Actually, I want to derive an improvement to the Euler scheme. To do this, let's rewrite now this exponential such that it looks a little bit more than the Euler scheme. So the Euler scheme had here the previous value of the y, and then it had the plus something, yeah, plus it change. So this is the, the change to the applied, yeah, that we get the dy. So I add here the previous value y, and I just subtract it here. Yeah? And apart from this, everything is, is the same. So this looks already a little bit like an Euler scheme. So now compare what we have here. So this is the Euler scheme. The next value is the previous value plus, and then there's no delta t term because my, my model was dy is sigma one y dw. So my Euler scheme is that this is just the coefficient sigma that is in front. So y times sigma multiplied with the delta w. So that's my Euler scheme. And now the exact solution, which we have derived, this exact solution is value at t plus delta t is equal to value at t. And now comes this multiplied with y exponential term with the constant coefficients minus one. So note, if this on top is the exact solution and the Brownian increment takes values from minus infinity to infinity, yeah? so it can be any value. Then you see that the true solution cannot become negative. Actually, you see this even better here. Take the starting value, and if this starting value is non-negative, you, you multiply it with an exponential. So whatever comes in here, the value will stay non-negative if it was non-negative. So we have just proven that this model yeah, has only the solution where y yeah, is non-negative, given the initial value is non-negative. But if you look at the Euler scheme, you see that you take your starting value, and then you multiply here with a constant, and then you multiply that constant with a random number that can be arbitrarily small, yeah? small in the sense that it becomes very, the absolute value can become very large and negative. The value is negative. So this means that the true solution cannot become negative if y was non-negative. However, the Euler scheme can generate such a solution. Can we find now out of this a numerical scheme that improves the situation a little bit? And to do this, let's do a Taylor expansion of this part here. Maybe include with the minus one. Yeah? So the Taylor expansion of the exponential is one plus x plus one half x squared and so on. And then we subtract the one. So what you have there is inside is x plus one half x squared. Okay, sub to thing. If you just take the first term, x, you would take the stuff that is inside here. So what you would have is the next value is the previous value plus y multiplied with sigma delta w. So this is exactly what you have in the Euler scheme. Next value is previous value plus y times sigma delta w. And then we have minus y multiplied with one half sigma squared delta t. So it looks as if you have the Euler scheme minus the drifting down part. This is not correct. Yeah? So this expectation does not match. Yeah? I mean, the guy is a martingale, and you would like to have that the expectation of this thing here 
Yeah, expectation of this is zero. So expectation of this thing here is just the y tilde at, at t. So if you were taking the Taylor expansion, just the x, we would get something wrong. We would get a numerical scheme that is wrong. And the thing is that to understand how the Taylor expansion has to look like now, you have to understand that this delta t here actually is the correction factor that belongs to the delta w being plugged in in the x squared. Yeah? So this stuff here. Yeah? So you see the delta t guy belongs to the delta w guy being plugged in in the x squared. So doing now the Taylor expansion, it is important to find the right point where we throw away terms. Yeah? So you, we don't throw away as many terms from the delta w part as we throw away guys from the delta t part. Okay, so here's now my Taylor expansion. So this here is the x guy. This is the x squared guy and so on. So now we plug in minus one half sigma squared delta t plus sigma delta w. So we plug these in and we multiply out here the x squared, yeah? So what do we get? So we get minus one half sigma squared delta t, yeah? The linear part with the delta t part plus sigma one delta w. Then I have sigma one delta w squared multiplied with the one half, yeah? So I get the delta w now in a squared with my sigma one and one half. Then I get from the delta t plus delta w squared, I get the mixed term yeah, with a certain coefficient. So I get a delta t times delta w. Okay, so delta w is like square root of delta t. Huh? So this thing is, um, yeah, actually expectation is uh, zero because you have a delta w. So this uh, is, this is a typo, yeah? So this is uh, like, so this is like a delta t to the power of three half. Huh? Then this is the mixed term and then you have the delta t squared. Okay, and you see this delta W squared, this belongs to the delta T. So the right point where we cut off is here. So we keep everything that is of order delta T yeah, or less. So then we have that this is now approximately, because I have thrown away Y, and now this is the part that is like in the Euler scheme, so sigma 1 times delta w multiplied with the y. So this is like in the Euler scheme. But now we have two additional terms. Now I have the y multiplied with minus 1 half sigma squared delta t and the y multiplied with plus one half sigma squared delta w squared. Okay, so I have a term delta w squared. So I collect the additional guys. That this is my delta w squared. This is my minus delta t. They both have in front the one half y sigma one squared. And this part here is like in the Euler scheme. So I have a correction factor. So this is my correction factor here. One half y sigma one squared delta w squared minus delta t. Yeah, and this correction factor has indeed expectation zero. 
written because expectation delta w squared is delta t, variance of uh, delta w is delta t. This has expectation zero, does not modify the expectation. But look what is happening. While in the Euler scheme, if you draw a random number here, let's say, and we start, say this here is the y of t, we start here, yeah, this is the t, and this is the t plus delta t. So this means that I now add to this a normal distributed random variable. Okay, and maybe I assume that this here is zero. Okay, then you see there is a positive probability that we fall below zero, right? So this can this can happen in the Euler scheme. But this happens if the delta W that you sample is very small, yeah? So absolute very value very large but negative. Yeah? So I fall very far on the negative side with the delta W. Look what the correction factor will do in this case. He will add something which is positive. So my correction factor, if delta W is very small, so that means delta W is smaller than zero and absolute value is large, yeah? much larger than the delta T, then this factor is large and it is positive, so it will pull the value up again. Yeah? So it will reduce a little bit the probability that we fall below zero. Yeah, and note that we derive this correction factor out of the exponential function that is actually in the other scheme, in this multiplicative scheme, guaranteeing that we are not falling below zero. So this is a motivation for the Milstein scheme. So let's quickly conclude. If you now look at the stochastic process that has in the sigma here, the two parts, sigma zero plus sigma one times x times dw. So I also have a constant. Then you actually can transform this stochastic process to our previous process y. Yeah, so actually you have the y is sigma zero divided by sigma one plus x. Yeah, yeah just multiply the dy by sigma one. Yeah, and you see that this gives you sigma zero, sigma one x dw. Okay, so I can plug in, I can you now use this and plug it in here in this scheme. I plug this definition of the y now in here in this scheme. So you see there is a sigma zero divided by sigma one plus x now there. And you get this general scheme. So I just plug this this um, in here. Yeah, this looks like the Euler scheme, which is just this part here. Yeah? This is the same as in the Euler scheme, plus an additional factor. And now my function, my sigma is a linear function. See, my sigma is a linear function here. Sigma zero plus sigma one x. So the correction factor is actually the sigma one half sigma multiplied with the sigma one, which is left over from here. Yeah? So if we plug this in there yeah, and we multiply with sigma one squared, yeah, we get the sigma zero plus sigma one x multiplied with the sigma one. And the sigma one is just the sigma differentiated with respect to x because it is a linear function in in X. This is the Milstein scheme. Okay, so that was just a small derivation motivation for this scheme. So it actually comes from assuming a linear dependency in the sigma term, then transforming to the uh, logarithm, derive this scheme with the exponential and do the Taylor expansion. So given an e stochastic process, 
DX is mu dt plus sigma dw. The Milstein scheme is now given as follows. Given my time discretization, the value at the next time point is the value at the previous time point plus an Euler step. This is just an Euler step. Plus the Milstein correction. Plus one half sigma times sigma prime delta w squared minus delta t. So this is the Milstein correction. Okay, I have an implementation that we can compare a little bit how this behaves compared to the Euler scheme for actually the process where the sigma depends on the on the x. Mills time scheme only improves the dw part. The next one is improving the dt part. This is also a nice idea. So we integrate mu dt. And what the Euler scheme does is to fix our coefficient, so the mu, to fix this coefficient at the starting point, the starting time, and also the starting value of my x. And this is what the Euler scheme does in the integration. Well, if you think of integration rules, an improvement would be the trapezoidal rule. So in the trapezoidal rule, you take the starting point, so this guy, and the end point, this guy, and then you build a triangle on top of that rectangular. So you take actually mu of ti and x of ti plus mu of ti plus 1 and x of ti plus 1, half times the time step size. So this would be the trapezoidal. The problem is uh, we do not know this endpoint. This would require that we already know the endpoint and we are evolving forward in time with our stochastic process. So how can I use this improved and from the picture you see it's a big improvement. Yeah? So if the mu has a strong dependency on the x, I already want to know where I'm going. Yeah? How can I use this improvement for the integral if I do not know where I will end up? So the thing is that we just use the Euler scheme to make a prediction where we go. So we take the Euler scheme to predict the value x till the star at ti plus 1 with an Euler step. And then we use this guy in our approximation. So I plug that in, which is then called the corrector step. Yeah? Predictor step is an Euler step. Corrector step is correcting the drift and stepping again. So this is the predictor corrector scheme given an e to stochastic process, same form, dx is mu dt plus sigma dw. We now perform the following scheme. The next value is the previous value plus one half mu ti x till the ti plus mu ti plus one x till ti delta ti plus sigma delta w. So the important thing is here that we have a modified approximation here of the drift part, the part that is then multiplied with the delta ti. The remaining part is as before in the Euler scheme. Where this x till the star of ti is given by an Euler step. So this scheme is called Euler scheme with predictor corrector step. A little note, yeah, also nice for the implementation. You do not need to do actually two steps. Yeah? So you see here, this part is exactly the same. So the part that creates the predictor, this is exactly the same 
as here. And also this part is the same. So you see the modification that we do is you take only one half of the Euler's drift. So you take one half of mu Ti, delta Ti, you take that away again and you add the mu of Ti plus one x till the star of Ti plus one and you take this one half and add it. So you can do your Euler step, yeah, remove one half of the Euler drift and add the corrected one half of the corrected drift. So you do not need to calculate this part here. Again, you can just correct your Euler step. So you have here an Euler step. This is already the x tilde star ti plus one, and then you have a correction term. This is the correction term, and the correction term is one half the corrected drift minus one half the previous drift. So for an implementation, this other formula is more efficient here because you do not have to calculate the Brownian increment and so on. Okay. Yeah, that was a small tour through time discretization schemes. Yeah? And uh, in this uh, section, I would like to apply now all the schemes we have seen. Yeah? Well, maybe not all, we don't do the predictor corrector one, but then instead we will do the exact scheme, the log Euler scheme to a log normal process.